Amen. Thank you so much. And it is by grace that we are here and by grace that we get to heaven. Amen. As we were singing also, I come to the garden alone and when Clarity said we're going to sing the last stanza a cappella, you can appreciate the, mu the, 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 the lyrics a little bit more and my desire and my hope and my plea is that everyone experiences the chorus. And he walks with me and talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. I hope that every one of you experiences that personal walk with God. For this morning, being the first Sabbath of the first year, I was thinking, you know, whether to have a sermon on, on unity of starting the year united, but you already know we need to be united. Amen. Or on commitment, where people make commitments. Um, but I decided to continue with the series that I took quite a break off on. And that's the pillars of our faith. We ended with the state of the dead in October. And November was taking a break. And December we looked at the light. Jesus being the light. Discovering that light. Disconnecting that light. And most of all sharing that light. And so this, this morning we're going to continue with one of our great pillars at Seventh-day Adventists. Actually, the pillar that separates us from all other churches, all other beliefs in the world. And that is the study or the belief of the Heavenly Sanctuary. For this, for this sermon, you will need the insert that was in your bulletin. If there is somebody who does not have one, please raise your hands and I'll ask for a deacon to pass the rest out. You will need this for this sermon as we go along the sermon. So if you do not have one, just raise your hand. There are some in the, in the balcony who don't have some. And you need to raise them up really high. Okay? Picking them up like this ain't going to work. Just, they need to see you. Here, here, I can give. I have an extra for Annette. Please keep your hands high until you receive one. There is one right there and then another one right there. And, and this, this doctrine is, is very, very important because the gospel is in the sanctuary. And how God deals with, how God deals with the great controversy is in the sanctuary. How God deals with Satan is in the sanctuary. How God deals with us is in the sanctuary. And so there are many other, well, I don't want to say many, but there are a few other churches that, that believe that when you die, you go to sleep. There are a few other churches that believe that Saturday, the seventh day, there is one other church that has a health message. But there is no other church that believes of that, that believes that there is a heavenly sanctuary and Jesus is doing something in that sanctuary. And we're going to look at that uh, today. And this is an introduction for this topic of the heavenly sanctuary. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I've asked you before and I ask you again that you open the minds of this congregation, the hearts to your word and to your will. Be with us. Continue to be with us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we turn to our first text in Colossians chapter 1, I'll ask the question, why did God create us? Why did He even create us? Col Colossians chapter 1 is our first text. Why did God take the time to make Adam, then to make Eve, when He knew did he not know that they were going to sin? 
Very, very interesting question. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. The Bible tells us, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or domitions or principalities of power. So, so, so far, everything was made by who? By God. Everything and everyone. All things were made, created through him. And what else? For him. Everything was created through him, but it was created also for him. So the skies, the hills, the mountains, the waters, us, we are created for God. We are created for God. God wasn't bored, but we are created for Him. He wanted us to be with Him. Because the Bible says that God is love. Does it not? And if we think back to the time where there were no beings, no angels, and it was just God alone. And the Bible says God is love. And in, in 1 Corinthians, love is, is, is putting others first. Sharing your love with others. God needed someone to share his love and someone else to love him. And so he started to create beings and angels and, and other beings and human beings as well. This is why in Genesis chapter 3, our next text, we see that, that as soon as Adam and Eve fell into sin, the one that went to go see and went to go meet with them was God. It wasn't Adam who ran to his heavenly father and tell him, I'm sorry, we disobeyed, we messed up. It wasn't Eve either. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This is after they had, after they had sinned. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? Where are you? It was God's initiative to search out for mankind. Why? Because He wants to be with them. He wants to be with them. That's why He created them for Him. He created us to be with Him. And praise the Lord that in Revelation, when this whole sin problem is wrapped up, Revelation 21, guess where we will be with with who we will be with. With God. Revelation 21, verse 3. They are talking about all things made new. It says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God will again be with his people. So if God really so desperately wants to be with us, what is it that is keeping him from being with us? It's sin. In Isaiah 59 verse 2, we are familiar with this verse. It says, but your iniquities or your sins have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you. That's why when Adam and Eve sinned, that separated them from their father. And so although God wants to be with us so bad, sin separates us from him. That's why we can't see God face to face. Because we are full of sin. And God is, doesn't even have a drop or an ounce of sin. Sin would evaporate if it was in the presence of God. So God being merciful saves our life by not appearing in His glory 100%. Because us full of sin would just evaporate and just die in the presence of a holy, holy God. And in 1 John 3 verse 5, If sin is a problem, 
then the solution is pretty easy. Just remove sin. Is that, is, can we say that that is the solution? If sin is what is keeping us from being with God, then just take away sin. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, let's read verse 4 and 5. Whoever commits sin also commits lawless, and sin is lawless. And you know that he was manifested. This is talking about capital H, Jesus. He was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. So Jesus was manifested. What's another way? What's another word for manifesting or or to be manifested? To appear, to come. Jesus came to take away what? Sin. Why? Because he wants to be with you. He wants to be with us. Okay? Jesus, God wants to be with us. And Jesus was manifested to take away our sin. God had to come to take away our sins so that we can be with him. And the way God first appeared to humanity is through the heavenly sanctuary, through the earthly sanctuary, I'm sorry, through the earthly sanctuary. That's why our scripture reading in there, Exodus 25 verse 8, here God say, and let them make me a sanctuary. Period? No. Why? That I may dwell among them. God has always wanted to be with his people. But yet there is this problem of sin. And he says, make a sanctuary so that I can be in the sanctuary and yet I can still be with my people. Just think about that, friends. God wants to be with you. He really wants to be with you. So much that he found a way to be among sinful people and yet still be with them. See, God did not want to be near you. He wanted to be with you. There's a difference. I am near you right now. Yes? But if I come down, and I hope this doesn't make up the microphone, but I am with you now. Right, Goldie? Right. God wants to be with you. Amen. Amen? Amen. Friends. Maybe I should not have done that. <laughs> Sorry. But I want you to get that across your minds. We need to stop thinking that God is up in heaven and He wants to be with us, but He's up there and we're out here alone. No, God wants to be with you, among you, close to you. So He instituted, He began the services of the sanctuary. So according to Exodus 25 verse 8, the purpose of the sanctuary is that God desires to be with you. God desires to be with you. But we still have that problem. And that's sin. Just because God was in the sanctuary doesn't mean that the sin problem went away. Sin was still the problem. So through the sanctuary system, God begins to remove sin from their lives and we're going to look at exactly what was the sanctuary system so now you can take a look at the at the insert that we passed out and the first page you can read that at home and the last page but if you open it up to the inside page where it says a look at the sanctuary you see there a little picture this is a bird's eye view, a top view of the sanctuary that God told Moses to build. And the little circles that go around are poles because there was a fence around the, the sanctuary system. And that inside that fence was considered the courtyard. And if you look on your right side which is the east side, you have there the entrance and the first thing when you enter the sanctuary, you would, you would have the altar of burnt offering. And then right after that, you would have this, this bowl that was called the laver. And then right after that, you would have these two rooms, the two compartments, which you had the holy place and the most holy place. 
So somebody would come to the courtyard, to the sanctuary, and the verses here are so you can read it and study it at home. We're not going to go through all the chapters and verses, but here, talking about the courtyard, you can read in Exodus 27, the dimensions, the size, the material it was to be made with, the holy place and the most holy place as well. But in the courtyard, you begin with the altar of burnt offerings. You can find that in Exodus 27, one through eight of how they were to make that. But that is where the sinner came and brought the animal and sacrificed it and represented the forgiveness of their sins. The forgiveness of their sins. The altar represents also where we come to the cross where Jesus forgives our sins. And we're going to look at, at all the specific furniture and their details next Sabbath. But I want to give you just an introduction to, to the earthly sanctuary that was here when, when Israel um, had it. And so then right after, right after the, the altar, you had the laver, the bowl of water, which had water on top and, some, and it had a little, a little cup with water in the bottom as well, where the priest would, after they would sacrifice the lamb, the animal, then you would come and they had to wash themselves before coming into the sanctuary, into the, into the holy place. And then inside the holy place, you had three articles of furniture. You had three pieces of furniture. You had the lampstand there. You had the table of showbread. And right before the most holy place, you had an altar of incense. And the priests would minister, would work in there every single day. Every single day, they would have to go and make sure that the lamps were always burning, that the bread was always there, and the incense were always as well going. And in the most holy place, which is the last room, or the second room there in, in the sanctuary, you had one piece of furniture, which was the Ark of the Covenant. In the most holy place, you, f you find the Ark of the Covenant, and there, if you're following, if you're following along on the, on the insert, Exodus 25, 10 through 22, gives the structures and dimensions of the Ark, which was basically a box made of wood covered with gold. But inside the box, you had the Ten Commandments of bowl of manna and Aaron's rod that budded. And on top, you, they, there was two angels covering, and you had a mercy seat, seat that was placed on top. You can, you can read all of what I'm telling you there on the scriptures that are listed on the handout. And there on the mercy seat is where the presence of God literally was. That is how God dwelt among them. By being in the most holy place, God's literal presence was there. That's why there was instructions that not just anyone can walk in. Because as soon as you walked in, into the most holy place and God is there, you would just die. You would just die. That's why the, the, the high priest, whenever he did go in there, he had to make sure, first of all, that he had, had a clean heart, had done his sacrifice and done everything that he was supposed to do to come before a holy God. Come before the presence of a holy God. And here is how God dwelt among his people. And this, this, this sanctuary is, was a portable sanctuary. Because where we read here in Exodus 25, this is the first mention of the sanctuary. Right after God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And on, on Mount Sinai, when God gave Moses the, the Ten Commandments, he gave, them, he gave him also the directions and instructions for the sanctuary. So when Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he also had in his mind on how to make the sanctuary. And there begins the process of God dwelling literally with his people. And how many years were the Israelites in the wilderness before they entered the promised land? Forty years. And they were following the cloud wherever, that was their GPS, wherever the cloud would go, they would follow it. 
So if the cloud decided to move east, they, had, they knew that they had to pack up and what? And follow the cloud and go where God was leading them. And the sanctuary as well. They had to pack it up. It was a portable sanctuary. A portable building. And they, and they would follow it, follow it until God says, this is your next stop. And they would set it up again. And God was inside of the most holy place every single time. That is how God dwelt among his people. And if we look in Leviticus chapter 16, we're there in Exodus, just turn to Leviticus chapter 16. Once a year, once a year, the, there was a ceremony, there was something that, that would happen in the sanctuary. And that was called the Day of Atonement. You see, every day, somebody would come and meet the priest and they would confess their sins and, and the priest would do a work there every day. But once a year, once a year, the priest would go into the most holy place in the Day of Atonement and, and intercede for all the sins of that year. And we're going to see next week as how, as how when they came into the, into the altar and had the, the sacrifice, the priest would take some of that blood, sprinkle it on the horns of the altar, take, after he washed himself, go inside the holy place, sprinkle it on the, on, the, on the altar of incense, sprinkle it on the veil, representing the sins are still there. And on the Day of Atonement, they were all done and wiped and clean. That's why in chapter 16, verse 29, verse 29, it says, This shall be a statue forever for you. In the seventh month of the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do not work at all, whether a native of your of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. So on this day, on this time, this once a year, you were to not work and be afflicting your soul, whether you had family, friends over, everybody was to do this. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean for all your sins before the Lord. And so here in this day, chapter 16 of Leviticus is, is a chapter on the Day of Atonement. And it gives instructions of everything that the priests were supposed to do. But this was the main point. That on that day, they shall make atonement for you to what? Clean you. That you may be cleansed from all your sins before the Lord. So according to this text, what would happen on that day? According to this text, when the priest went in there and, and had atonement for all the sins of the year, what would happen then on that day? At the end of the day? You would be clean from sin. You would be totally clean from sin. God's people were cleansed. God's people were cleansed. Now, right now, there is no portable sanctuary. Uh, on the contrary, they want to build the temple. Um, and we'll be, we'll be talking a little bit more on that in a couple of weeks. And you may ask yourself, well, what does this have to do with us today? In January 2014. What is the purpose of God? Why can't we be with God? Because sin. And how did God take care of it in the Old Testament? With the sanctuary. He dwelt with them. And he would clean them. Every year. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. What did this have to do with us today? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. Do we, do we still need cleansing today? Does God still want to be with us today? Absolutely. Nothing has changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. No, I'm sorry, 5. Thank you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. And it's the last part. 
but we'll read the, the first part. It says, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since truly our unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Now, here Paul is telling us that Christ is our Passover and that he was sacrificed for us. Now, any Jewish, any Jew reading this verse can relate this to the sanctuary. Because when, whenever a Jew heard anything like atonement, a sacrifice, they recognized it, that it had to do with the sanctuary services. And we're going to see next week that that lamb or that animal that was brought to the altar that people confess their sins and that the animal died instead of you represents Jesus Christ. And that he is the one who was sacrificed for us. That's why in John 1.29, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Why didn't he just say, Behold the Son of God? But he says, The Lamb of God. Because the Lamb, the, the lamb was a symbol of sacrifice for the sins of the people. And Christ took away our sins. And in order for us to be cleansed, there needs to be bloodshed. We may not understand it, we may not like it, but the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There had to be the shedding of blood. It's not that God enjoys seeing animals suffer and die, no. But there needed to be death because the wages of sin is death. God said from the very beginning, in the day that you disobey, you will die. The wages of sin is death. So there has to be a death, but God has mercy and says, let the lamb die and you live. The lamb will take your, your death penalty and you will live. And when Jesus came, he took our death penalty so that we may live. And this is how it affects us today. Jesus is our sacrifice. Now remembering in Leviticus chapter 16, the, the priest would go once a year and have atonement for all their sins and would go into the most holy place. And if you turn into your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 8, this is how it affects us today in January 2014. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 1. You may say, well, that's all nice, fine and dandy, something that Israel would do hundreds of years ago. What does that have to do with us today? Hebrews chapter 8 tells us. It says, now this is the main point of the things which we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So just, just these verses, it should remind you of the earthly sanctuary that Israel had. Any, any Jew, any disciple, any person who knew the writings of Moses or of the prophets, when reading here what Hebrews says, their mind would point them back to the earthly sanctuary. But yet here, it says there is a sanctuary somewhere else. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So where is this priest at? In heaven. Verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gift and sacrifice. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy, notice this, the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So, the earthly temple or the earthly sanctuary were a copy or shadows of what? Of the heavenly things. It says, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make it all, see that you make all things according to the patterns shown 
you on the mountain. So there on the mountain, when besides Moses getting the Ten Commandments, he got the pattern of the sanctuary. And the pattern that he saw was a pattern in heaven that was already there. Verse 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So is this text suggesting that there is a sanctuary in heaven? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 9. Just go to the next chapter in verse 24 and 25. For Christ has not entered the holy place. Does that sound familiar? The holy place. Made with hands. Okay. Somebody may think, oh, but the holy place is heaven. No, read the rest of the verse. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands. The only holy place made with hands is a holy place in the sanctuary. Which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Now appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. So here we see also that there is a sanctuary in heaven where Christ is in there, in the holy place. In the holy place. He has not yet entered the most holy place. Which he will when we, get to, to, when, when we get to the study of Daniel. But here Christ is in the holy place, but not on an earthly sanctuary, but on a heavenly sanctuary. Revelation chapter 11 also just, just gives us more evidence that there is a sanctuary in heaven for those who are still not sure. And I purposely, if you look in your bulletin, there are no quotes from the spirit of prophecy. None. I purposely did that because I have been accused or the church has been accused that this doctrine was made up by Sister White. And we're going to show you that it all comes from the, from the Bible. Amen. Everything we believe comes from the, from the scripture. Amen. So Revelation chapter 11 verse 19. Here it says, Then the temple of God was opened. Here John is in vision and he's seen in heaven. The temple of God was open in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Where, where does that ark of the covenant remind you of? The sanctuary. But there is one in what? In heaven. And there was lightning, noise, thundering, and earthquake and great hail. So there John in his vision sees a sanctuary with the ark of the covenant in it as well. Now turn to Psalms 102. Psalms 102 and verse 19. There are many verses, but this, this will be the last one regarding the sanctuary in heaven. Psalms 102, verse, 9, verse 19. If there is a sanctuary in heaven and Jesus is in there and the Bible, as we read, in Hebrews 8 and 9, that he is our priest, then he is doing the same thing that the priest would be doing down here during the days of, of Moses. But he is doing it in heaven. Verse 19, it says, For he, who is this he? God, Jesus. Okay, it's capital H. For he looked down from the heights of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth. So there we see just another verse that there is a sanctuary where God is. So according to Hebrews, Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary interceding as our high priest. This is how it affects us today. We are Israel and Paul and we, and we, we, we can go to it where, where Paul tells us that we are spiritual Israel. And we are spiritual Israel, and Jesus is our high priest, and the sanctuary is no longer here on earth, but is in heaven. He is in there doing a work for us. And what's that work? The same work that the priest did when he was here on earth. 
and that was to remove sin from the people. To remove sin from the people. Why? Because God wants to be with you and me. And so Jesus is in the sanctuary in heaven. Why? Because he wants to be with us. And the sanctuary services is how God removes sin from Israel. And the sanctuary services in heaven is how he will remove it. And he is removing it from us today. Praise the Lord. The sanctuary system is God's way of removing sin from our lives and God's way of being with us today. So friends, I wanted to give you just a brief introduction of the sanctuary and take, take this, this study guide home and read it all and read the verses in there. Double, you can double check the verses that I put. If I made a mistake, please tell me if they have nothing to do with what I'm saying. And there is also, on your way out today, a free study guide on where the painting is. There are two music stands there where there will be free study guides regarding this subject of the sanctuary. They are free. Pick one up. Pick two if you want to give one away uh, for you to have and to study. We're going to be going into more detail uh, as the weeks go by, but I want to give an introduction of the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, and not just that, but that there is one in heaven. And if there is one in heaven and God is interceding and doing there, then there is something that we need to be doing. And we're going to see that Israel on earth were doing something while the high priest was inside the most holy place. And whatever the people were doing, we are doing, we should be doing something as well. So for our closing verse in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26, there we read earlier 24, where Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are a copies of the true tabernacle, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God, not that he should offer himself once as the priest, as the high priest enters a most holy place every year with blood of another. Verse 26. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for man to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once. How many times is Christ offered? One time. One time. When we have communion, we are remembering his sacrifice. We are not sacrificing God every communion. We are remembering. Christ only had to die once. Amen. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Who are the many? Here they are. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. But this time, what, what, what does it say? Apart from what? From sin. For salvation. That is the purpose of the sanctuary. For God to be able to remove sin, what is, what, what is interfering in being with you and me. You see, God loves us so much, but he hates sin. He has to do a, what would you call it? Sin, synoctomy? Or <laughs> when you take away, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a medical student. Synectomy? Take it away. And through the sanctuary is how he is doing it. And because he wants to live with you and with me. And, and the sanctuary was God's way of, of, of being with his people in Israel. And when Jesus came, that's why, that's why the Bible tells us, um, that's why the Bible tells us in, in, in Haggai chapter 2, that when Jesus came, the, sanct, the, the temple was more glorious than the previous temple. And it was more glorious because God was here himself, walking in the sanctuary, in the temple. You didn't have him in the, in the most holy place like you did before, but you had him walking 
You could touch him and feel him. That's why the, the, the new temple, Herod's temple, was more glorious because the Son of God was literally walking among his people. And that is God's plea, God's desire to be with you. So how many of us want to see God face to face? <laughs> how many of us are willing to let God be removing sin from our lives? That's, that's the only thing that's keeping us from seeing him is sin. Our sins have separated us from him. And may God bless you personally, church, in this decision. And as we, as we continue seeing the sanctuary, we're going to see how God does that, how God removes sin. In every single piece of furniture, in every single service, we're going to study on how God is removing sin from our lives. Because the goal is, he wants to be with you and wants to be with me. Amen? Amen. May God bless you. And let's, 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 let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we've briefly seen just an introduction of the sanctuary that you had given Moses. But we see even more important that there is one in heaven. It's not done away with. And the work that you are doing there is the work that the priest would do down here. So help us as we, begin, as we begin to dive into this subject to see the importance of this message and how you are removing sin or how you want to remove sin so you can dwell with us forever. Be with your church today and be with your church around the world as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I invite you to open your hymn books to hymn number 187. 187, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Appropriate with the sanctuary, Jesus is a friend of sinners. If the congregation would please stand for a closing hymn, hymn number 187. Hymn number 187.